Okay. 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 Welcome to the Tuesday, November 17th Montgomery County Commission meeting. This meeting is being conducted by video conference via zoom.us due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting will be live streamed on the county's Facebook page at Montgomery County, will be available on local public access television, DATV, and will be posted on the county's website at www.mcohio.org per guidelines approved by House Bill 197. Madam Clerk. Commissioner Rice? Here. Commissioner Lieberman? Here. Commissioner Dodge? Here. Okay, first off, we have addressing racism as a public health crisis, and I believe Mr. Kelly, Tom Kelly, you'd like to say a few words before we get started. Thank you, Commissioner Dodds, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, in June, our commissioners declared racism a public health crisis in Montgomery County. This certainly does not mean that racism is anything new, nor does it mean that there are easy ways to resolve it. What it does mean is that our county leaders want to ensure racism issues are identified and encourage open, honest dialogue that will lead to appropriate and speedy resolution. Change doesn't happen overnight, but the commissioners want to initiate that conversation that generates ideas to find real tangible solutions to this crisis. Racism is contrary to our values and mission. An unbalanced community is inequitable and unjust. We have the power to make real lasting change and we must lead by example and own this work. Our county departments will help us report our progress back to the community on this work and hold us accountable for the progress that we make. This is a dialogue and partnership with our community. We must be transparent in our findings and ensure regular community reports. We want you to hold us accountable. Today, we are providing our first community report. You will hear about efforts that have been in place and ongoing, as well as new initiatives. The report will be provided this afternoon by Geraldine Pegues, our Director of Human Services Planning and Development. I'd like to thank Jerry and the entire Montgomery County team that's making all of this work and the reporting possible. Now I'm gonna hand off to Jerry and allow Jerry to make the report to the community on our behalf. Thank you, Tom. It takes just a few minutes to load it up. So thanks again, and thanks commissioners and accounting administrator for allowing us the opportunity to make the presentation today. As you can see here, the resolution was passed in June of this year addressing racial inequities as a priority. Racism is the root cause of poverty, negative social determinants of health, overall poor health outcomes, persistent discrimination, disparate outcomes as well. And we are committed to equity and social justice for all citizens. I wanna start the presentation by speaking about racial disparities. I'm trying to move over pictures. Um, you can see here, we've identified a few of the disparities that exist in our community, but there are many more. 32.8% of black people live below the poverty level compared to 13.3% of white people in Montgomery County. We have 18.8% was the overall unemployment rate in Montgomery County at the end of September. Historically, African -American, the African-American rate has been significantly higher or double the overall rate. In Montgomery County, food deserts are largely in census tracts with a high percentage of minority populations, including West Dayton and also Trotwood. We know that in, in 2019, African-Americans made up 45% of the Montgomery County homeless population, but only 21% of the general population. Black babies in Montgomery County 
die a rate four times higher than white babies. We cannot address these disparities alone. Therefore, we are raising community awareness and will continue to do so in the future. Imagine if we eliminate just a few of these disparities, more people will be employed with wages and benefits to support their families. People would have access to healthy food options and affordable housing and our physical and behavioral health would improve. Our mothers will survive childbirth and our babies would grow up and live long lives into their senior years. Addressing racial disparities increases positive outcomes for all residents. The presentation will demonstrate the actions taken to date and those that are planned for in the future. Our commissioners and county administrator are committed and you will see that in the five months, along with addressing the crisis of the pandemic, we've also been putting solutions in place. Addressing racism can take many paths. However, we know that access to services and opportunities, addressing policies and practices and working in partnership with the community are significant factors to begin this work to address racism as a public health issue. We have taken each of the actions noted in the resolution and categorized them here in the three areas. You can see access to services and opportunity is in the blue, policy and practice is in the green, and aligned engagement, aligned engagement is in the orange color. Actions may and will cross into different categories. However, for this presentation, we have placed them in their primary areas. In addition, there are different levels in which you can begin this work. You will notice that some of the actions address impacts on individuals and others address businesses and systems. This is intentional. As we know, it takes many different actions to make changes needed to eliminate disparities. We are committed to dismantling those processes and practices that create barriers to success for all. Most recently, at the end of October, the commissioners held a ribbon cutting for the announcement of the new Westtown Community Employment Opportunity Center. Several community partners spoke at the event and community members were excited about this resource and what it will bring to their community, employment and skill training opportunities in this area. The estimated opening of the center is the spring of 2021. It's a $2 million investment and it's a commitment of at least 10 years. Additional investments have been secured um, for this investment through the Greater Ohio Workforce Board. And you can see here the types of services that it will include, adult and youth career employment services, a job bank and resource room. There will be a community space for um, meetings and activities. Job and family services will also have um, staff on site and be able to provide some basic customer service. So people will be able to pick up applications, they'll be able to turn in their applications, schedule appointments. They'll also be able to get online and utilize the portal. The Miami Valley Career Technology Center, Adult Education and Aspire Services will also be offered. In addition, other services may come to the site. It'll be based upon the needs of those that are using it. This center will be an access for all in the neighboring communities, Jefferson Township, Drexel, Residence Park, Westwood, and many more communities than I have noted today. In addition, earlier this summer, the mobile workforce truck rolled out to be an additional outreach tool. This workforce mobile will allow employment services to be deployed into the community for use for adults and youth. When expanded, there is room for people to use laptops for job searching and to complete or update their Ohio Means Jobs profiles. They also have spaces on this mobile where um, individuals can speak with staff about needs that they have. 
the Male Leadership um, Academy at the bottom launched in 2019 and will be housed in the Westtown Employment Opportunity Center once it opens. The Male Leadership Academy provides opportunity for young men involved to attend special and amazing activities throughout the community. And this past year, they, they attended the Black Violin Concert, a night of the symphonic hip hop with Wycliffe Jean. They also provided community services and attended professional development sessions. Most recently, they participated in a three-day virtual enrichment Hill Harper Empowerment Series hosted by the actor and author Hill Harper. Job training, employment recruitment, and the Youth Career Services 365 are the primary focus areas in workforce. Job training is provided to assist those who are looking to increase their skills or make a career change or receive certification in an in-demand area. Workforce partners with several local nonprofits to provide soft skills training through the Ready for Work program. In addition, they've hosted job fairs and employment workshops. In 2019, 58% of the job training adults served were African-American. Working with the local businesses to attract and hire qualified candidates and to connect job seekers with opportunities to increase their skills, to be more marketable to employees in another function is another function of this department. Our goal is to help individuals achieve self-sufficiency leading to economic parity. Of the people who receive job placement services, 48% were African-American. Montgomery County has one of the largest youth employment programs in Ohio, Youth Career Services 365. Youth are employed in various sectors throughout Montgomery County to gain paid work experience during the summer months. And then some youth have the opportunity to continue their employment throughout the year. Some of the services also offered to youth are tutoring, leadership development, financial literacy awareness, as well as the employment support. We desire to help youth achieve success in the classroom, through employment and community experiences. We want the youth to be successful when entering the workforce through full-time employment, attending college, joining the military, or attending an apprenticeship program. The microenterprise program was put on hold this year for most of 2020 due to COVID. However, they anticipate continuing these services in 2021. But prior to COVID, there were some small businesses, as you can see here, that received support through the microenterprise program. The, um, some of the other um, businesses that are not located on this slide are first priority urgent care located in Trotwood and also Seven Spa, which was located in Kettering. To be eligible for this program, you must be a minority owned, female owned, or veteran owned small businesses. It is important that we have a diverse pool of vendors in our community. We want to be sure everyone in the community has access to the information by knowing where to go to become a vendor with Montgomery County. The www.mcohio.org website has a wealth of information for more specifically clicking on the purchasing department link provides directions for becoming a vendor and the current bids available. In reference to the microenterprise investments that I discussed, since 2016, out of um, 50 small business awards, 26 were minority owned, 32 businesses were female owned, and there was one business that was veteran owned. And some of the businesses fit in more than one category. It is anticipated, as I said before, that this program will relaunch in 2021 in the first quarter. I mentioned having a diverse pool of vendors is important. 
you can see here that the average diverse spend with minority business enterprises is $976,810. And of that total, the average spend with businesses that identified as African-American owned businesses is $384,215. So there are a few of the these are a few of the investments that have made that have been made so far, and you can see here through various through our various um, grant programs to support economic development and disadvantaged neighborhoods is pictured Omega CDC, the Gym City Market, and both structures as you can see are going up and are being worked on now and we're excited about their opening coming next year. Commissioner Rice has been a leader in this space advocating for affordable housing and you can see her picture below at a Habitat for Humanity home site. As many of you know, we're very excited about the renovation of the arcade. I can remember going into the rotunda as a youngster and looking up into the stained glass ceilings. This renovation will also include some affordable housing. Montgomery County invested $350,000 in the Hope Center and $175,000 in the Gym City Market. These investments will provide greater access to employment and other services and healthy food options in these communities and for anyone that wants to shop there or shop at the Gym City Market. Montgomery County has also made significant investments in the area of safe and affordable housing. We have invested through home funding nearly $27 million. Noted are the investments in the African-American households. Of the 27 million invested from 1992 to 2020, there were 225 African-American households that received rental assistance. 416 African-American households received tenant-based rental assistance. Also, the, there were 54 African-American households that received home buyer assistance and 92 households that received homeowner rehab. And these numbers may include duplicated numbers. Montgomery County has been very fortunate to receive additional resources in CARES funding. One of the funding areas established was the Mortgage Assistance Program at $5 million. And you can see here that 70 African-American households or 38% were assisted. So they were 38% um, of the total were assisted. During the pandemic, we noticed early on the challenges that were being faced by residents in our community and specifically those located in food deserts. Many major grocery stores have pulled out of communities located in West Dayton. These investments help all residents in our community have access to food and healthy food options. Commissioner Dodge has been a leader in this space and is one of the chairs of the Montgomery County Food Equity Coalition. They hosted their um, 10th annual food summit in October. So before you are pictures of some of these investments, there's the unveiling of two very significant um, trucks in our community. The one at the top and I hate to say left or right because I'm sitting in a different location than you, but the picture, it depicts the food bank distribution truck. And this truck helps deliver resources all over the community to local pantries and other sites. You may also have seen this truck um, during the big food distribution events that were held in the community. In addition, with grocery stores leaving the com community, Montgomery County invested in the Home Full Mobile Grocery Store, which provides healthy food and other food options and small household um, items for the community to purchase. This mobile grocery store operates just like a regular grocery store. It's just on wheels. The grocery store will also be deployed in the community in those areas that are food deserts. The bottom picture shows seniors receiving food boxes during the pandemic to help them. 
And on the right side, you can see one of the pop-up free fresh vegetable food stands. People in our community really came together to support one another and Montgomery County was a partner in these efforts. Montgomery County leveraged over $3 million in CARES Act in this area to support residents to make sure they had access to food. As mentioned, these investments included the food distribution truck and also the home full mobile grocery market. And listen, I've also um, shared with you the populations in the West Dayton and Trowood area of which um, the food deserts are located. JFS provides access to food nutrition through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Through income eligibility, monetary benefits are distributed monthly to acquire food. It is important to note that in October 2020, over 35,800 African-American Montgomery County residents received assistance. This represents 49% of the total Montgomery County SNAP recipients. This benefit helps supplement the food purchasing power of African-American families in our community. There was over 3.2 million issued to over 12,000, almost 400 families in Northwest Montgomery County. And the highest numbers of African-Americans utilizing SNAP reside in the following zip codes or 45406 and 45417. The Everyone Reach One Maternal and Infant Vitality Task Force led by Commissioner Lieberman focuses on strategies to improve maternal and infant vitality. This work is done through working with local community-based organizations. They are fo focused in areas with relatively high infant mortality rates and racial disparities. And some of the zip codes I've already noted, 45406, and 45417, and there are others that are also included in this effort. The task force was awarded resources to assist with addressing this community issue, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. JFS also provides access to healthcare through the Medicaid program. Through income eligibility, healthcare access is made available through the managed care providers. Montgomery County received 3.6 million from the Ohio Department of Medicaid to support these community issues, initiatives, excuse me, to support these community issues, initiatives aimed at reducing racial disparity and infant mortality and the infant mortality rate. The target population served by this program are women and their families across Montgomery County with an emphasis on reaching African-American women and mothers with children under the age of one. The six areas of focus include breastfeeding, community engagement, maternal vitality, prevention services, safe sleep, and services to address substance abuse. These prevention and intervention strategies are evidence-based and are being implemented by trained professionals. There are several community-based programs that are involved with these efforts, Catholic Social Services, Every Parent Matters Program, the Five Rivers Health Center, Help Me Grow Brighter Futures, Miami Valley Organizing Collaborative, and the Wesley Community Center. This slide shares why it's important to address this issue as a community issue. In 2019, infant mortality rates for Ohio were 8.9% for all races and a 7.1% for white babies. However, in 2019, the Montgomery County Black infant mortality rate was 12.6%. Now this is a decrease from 16.9% in, in 2017. However, it's still a huge issue in our community and has to be addressed by our community. In October 2020, there were 59,324 African-American residents that were Medicaid eligible. You can see here the breakdown by the number of children, working adults, and those age 56 and older. 
Also, these benefits provide direct access to medically needed services and purchasing power and the purchasing power of African-American families in Montgomery County. You can see the highest number of African-Americans utilizing Medicaid reside in zip codes 45406 and 45417. Moving into the category of addressing policy and practices, Montgomery County is committed to equity and social justice for all citizens involving racial equity, inclusion, and diversity in all aspects of county government. Internally, Montgomery County has included diversity training as a part of its onboarding and orientation for new staff. We are also bringing awareness by offering specific trainings to address implicit bias, trauma-informed care, and mental health first aid. We are reviewing our recruitment practices and internal policies. Most, Montgomery County is also continuing partnerships which bring together intern students from our local universities. Um, as, at a systems and community level, we started this year off with the Aligning for Impact Training Conference, which brought together over 300 people to discuss how do we align our efforts. Also to look at um, the disparities that exist in the different sectors in our community and to discuss how does everyone play a role in addressing these issues to make our community a better place for all. Most recently, in partnership with the Alcohol and Drug Addiction Mental Health Services Board, Montgomery County partnered to bring Dr. Susan Strauss, a nationally recognized expert author and international speaker to discuss how to strategically address Black Lives Matter, white privilege and unconscious bias in the workplace it's about more than training and policy. It was a two day session. The first day it included um, presentations to the public and private sector leaders. And then the second day was focused on community members and organizational staff. As you can see, there were over 650 community and I would say statewide because there were people from all over the state that were on this training. It shows that there is very much interest in our community to address this issue. Continuing with policy and practice, prioritizing the health and well being of Montgomery County residents is not new to the commission or our county administrator. At the top of the slide, you can see where make, um, the JFS on the Move program goes out into the community to provide the services. And you can see here where there is a JFS staff person working with um, Montgomery County residents. The middle picture uh, is the grand opening of the Reentry Career Alliance Training Center. This provides valuable supports and services to returning citizens in our community. And then below is the Preschool Promise Program, which offers supports to four-year-olds within our community to attend preschool, utilizing tuition assistance and also provides support to child care centers focused on quality learning environments. Montgomery County has been a leader in this space for a long time. Started with the pilot to a demonstration and then further financial assistance and commitments to support children to be ready for kindergarten. JFS provides emergency assistance through our TANF assistance program or temporary assistance to needy families. Through this income eligibility, monetary benefits are distributed monthly to acquire basic needs. It is important to note that in October 2020, you can see here there, there were over 2,500 African-American families, or excuse me, African-American residents that received benefits, which represents 51% of the total TANF recipients. The highest number of African-Americans utilizing TANF reside in the following zip codes, 45406 and 45417. 
The JFS on the Move was initiated as a community outreach program to take services outside of the walls of the job center. A specialized team staff scheduled on-site days at various community locations to be able to talk with residents about their needs. This um, effort will continue once the excuse me, pandemic is over. JFS is the largest single payer of public child care in Montgomery County. This benefit makes it possible for adults to attend school, training or work to receive income to take care of their families. Significant child care investments are made in the African American community to support families and their children. In September 2020, 1.4 million was issued to support over 2,500 children and families residing in Northwest Montgomery County. Preschool Promise has a goal of closing the achievement gap between children of color and their white peers, and also between girls and boys so that all children have an equitable start at kindergarten. Preschool Promise provides tuition assistance to families located in the city of Dayton, as well as Jefferson Township, Matt River Township, and Trotwood. You can see here that over 1,800 four-year-olds were served during this time period. Preschool Promise also offers professional training and stipends for teachers, and there's a community engagement um, activities as well. In 2021, Montgomery County will invest in sales tax revenue and also human services levy funds, the $3 million. Moving on to the Reentry Career Alliance Academy, for the last decade, or in over the last decade, the Office of Reentry has served over 500 individuals who have been in incarcerated or justice involved, ensuring that they have the tools needed to move forward positively in their lives and in their families and in the community. The Montgomery County Office of Reentry carries out its work primarily through the Reentry Career Alliance Academy and the Eichelberger InReach program. The ultimate goal of the Office of Reentry is to ensure successful return to Montgomery County without reoffending. From the beginning of the program, you can see here from February 2015 through December 2019, 545 individuals completed the Reentry Career Alliance Academy. They had a post program success rate of 95%, which means the graduates have not reoffended. The Reentry Career Alliance Academy is a multi-week program, and this academy offers career and job readiness curriculum for returning citizens, as well as opportunities for case management and other resource connections. In 2019, you can see that the academy had a 74% graduation completion rate, and of those that graduated, 63% were African American, and of the um, graduate, the graduates, 90% of them that participated in the program had a negative drug screen. Participants of the Career Alliance Academy are also eligible to receive job placement and participate in advanced training. The Office of Reentry, as I mentioned, also employs a specialist through the Eichel Barker Foundation. This in-reach specialist visits institutions throughout the state of Ohio. And you can see here that from September to December in 2019, there were 27 institutions visited and there were 340 in-reach visits made. <clears throat> um, one of the um, really exciting pieces is that with this in-reach program, the person is then able to meet with the individual while they're still in the institutions and share resources um, for them so that when they exit, they are able to connect with the Reentry Career Alliance Academy. As you can see by the actions that I've discussed so far, Montgomery County is committed to addressing racism through actions that have long-term positive impacts.
Our commissioners are engaged locally and sit on many boards and committees. They are engaged on the um, regional, state, and the national levels. Our commissioners' advocacy efforts support businesses, also individuals, and the community at large. They are always reaching and seeking ways of bringing additional supports to our community and also looking at ways in which we can, we can improve current practices. They value every resident. And then the third area of focus, the aligned engagement, solidifying um, alliances is also important to this work as no one can do it alone. I have highlighted some of the county efforts and also want to note that the county is a collaborative partner, <clears throat> excuse me, and sits on various committees confronting racism and equity. And we've noted some here. We've identified Montgomery County, we identified the Adams Board, Public Health, our Family and Children First Council, and the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, who are working to address these issues. Montgomery County staff have met with community-based organizations that have expressed an interest in learning more about community services, and we will continue those discussions in the future. Montgomery County is an active participant in community-wide equity and anti-racism discussions and planning. County leadership, human services systems, business services systems, and staff are members of state level um, racial equity efforts. And also collaborative efforts are, excuse me, collaborative efforts to engage racial and ethnic minority groups will continue as we to respond to any of their concerns. While this is the first progress update since the passage of the resolution, it is our intent to keep the community informed. You should also note that some of the actions that um, were reported on today may change depending on the community's um, environment and the need to address the issue in a different manner. We will keep the community updated as we report out if there are any changes to what we've shared. In closing, I would like to thank the departments that provided the data for this progress report. Each are noted on the slide. And this was truly a collaborative effort to bring all of this together. And it also demonstrated our efforts to address racism as a public health issue. Not noted on the slide, but should receive um, recognition for his leadership is our county administrator, Michael Colbert. I also would like to recognize my boss, Assistant County Administrator, Tom Kelly. I thank you all for allowing this presentation and are there any questions? Wow, thank you, Jerry, and uh, everybody that participated in this. This is just absolutely mind boggling. That's all I can say. The early statistics that you quoted early on, sobering, no question about it with our community. But um, I'm just so impressed with the action items and so many of these we are in the process of completing. So please uh, thank everyone that participated in this and it's just a great job, great job. So thank you. I, I would also chime in with that. Um, you know, we said in the beginning when we um, passed the resolution that we wanted real substance and we knew we did a lot and um, Jerry, you've really, and everyone who worked on it has pulled together a pretty comprehensive uh, presentation of the many things that we're doing and where we're heading. So I, I truly do appreciate it because it gives us a roadmap and we mean it uh, and we meant it then and we mean it today that we're gonna hold ourselves accountable um, because these are big issues that will take lots of time and lots of collaboration to, um, I don't know that we'll solve all of these, but we will certainly keep heading in the right direction and never be satisfied until we do solve them. Um, so thank you. Um, and I can tell you that I will be able to share this with others and other venues to kind of show where we are today and continue to get input 
of uh, as new ideas come along. But thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for all this hard work. And Tom and the whole team, everybody involved, I really appreciate this. I too just wanna say thank you. Um, it's great to see it all put together, um, the things that we've accomplished, knowing what we still need to do. Um, it's great, it's great work. Um, you know, I think, I know uh, we all work every day on these, on, on these things that we just uh, viewed, different sections of it. I'm really proud of our county. Um, you know, I, a lot of jurisdictions throughout the country um, put the words on paper and pass resolutions, but we know that um, we're all very dedicated to this and we're going to keep working on it. And um, the next uh, update, I'm sure we'll have some further progress. So thanks a lot, Jerry and everybody that was a part of this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, County Engineer. Good afternoon, commissioners, administrators, ladies and gentlemen online. Uh, we have four resolutions today. The first is resolution 20-1463, authorizing an agreement with Security Fence Group Incorporated for the traffic signal maintenance, repair, and minor construction project countywide at their lowest and best bid of $114,881.43 through February 28th of 2022. 1464 is to amend the agreement with Brumbaugh Construction Inc. for the Snyder Road Bridge Rehabilitation Project in the city of Trotwood by adding $6,000 to the original amount for a revised total of $222,744.98 due to a change order. 1465 is to authorize the county engineer to proceed with force account work during 2021 as provided under section 5543.19 of the Ohio Revised Code. And 1466 is to approve the 2020 partnership pool program of Township Aid. Move for approval. to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, County Aye. Sheriff. Uh, thank County. you. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Dodge. Under the County Sheriff, uh, we have Resolution 20 1467, which will authorize a payment by warrant to Nilla, Glo Nilla Gloves Incorporated in the amount of $3,435. I move for approval. All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Juvenile Court. Under the Juvenile Court, we have Resolution 20-1468, which will accept a continuation grant agreement with the Juvenile Court Foundation for funding support of a coordinator of volunteers in the Juvenile Court's CASA program through a grant from the Virginia Kettering Foundation in an amount not to exceed $30,000 through December 31st, of 2021. I move for approval. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Miami Valley Regional Crime Lab. Under the Crime Lab, we have Resolution 20 1469, which will accept a grant from the Office of Criminal Justice Services for opiate testing, supplies, training, and travel in the amount of $41,387.70. I move for approval. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Under the county administrator, uh, Tom, I know you're going to read that. And I just wanted to extend our sympathy to Michael Colbert. His father passed away over the weekend. And I know that we all extend uh, our sympathy to him and his family. And Tom, at the end of the... Um, meeting here, I think you're going to say a few words about uh, Michael's dad, because you knew him. So anyway, uh, here's the county administrator, Tom. Okay, um, under the clerk's office, we would ask that you approve the minutes of the meetings on November 10th of 2020, and approve the bills uh, under 1470, and that list is available in the clerk's office. I move for approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Administrative Services. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, we have just a small amount of resolutions today. Uh, the first is 1471. This is the approval of the elections. This list is available in the clerk's office. 
1472 accepts a quick claim deed from the Miami Conservancy District for real property known as the Webster Street Gun Range, Butler Township, for site improvements for the Sheriff's Firing Range project and record the same. Uh, 1473 amends the agreement with LWC Incorporated Project Architect for the Municipal Court in, uh, in Trotwood project by adding $31,150 to the original amount for a revised sale of $430,150 due to a change in the works, uh, the scope of work. And last is 1474. This authorizes the purchase and installation through a state term contract for, um, sorry, from Comfort Systems USA for HVAC controller upgrades and replacements for the Stillwater Health Center in an amount not to exceed $277,814.47. I move to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Environmental services, Matt. Good afternoon, commissioners. I have seven resolutions today. Resolution 1475, authorize an agreement with Municipal and Contractors Ceiling Products, Inc. for the rehabilitation of manholes as part of the Brookville Lake Estates Sanitary Sewer Improvements phase two project at their lowest and best bid of $39,712 through December 31st, 2021. Resolution 1476, authorize a land use permit with the Miami Conservancy District to permit use of land in association with the existing Dryden Road South Miami Shores well field for a period of 20 years through February 29th, 2040. Resolution 1477, Accept water mains for the Woodland Hills Water Main Replacement Project Phase 3, Resolution 1478, release 100% of the letter of credit and the subdividers contract from BWC Holdings LTD for the villages of Winding Creek Boulevard, Section 7. Resolution 1479, release 100% of the subdividers contract from the Miami Valley Career Technology Center for the MVCTC sanitary sewer extension project. Then we have the uh, final two or two men agreements. The first is res resolution 1480, Bricker and Eckler LLP for assistance and procurement of a design build firm for the sanitary conveyance and treatment Western regional project by extending the term through December 31st, 2021. And resolution 1481, Building Crafts Inc for the construction of the trickling filter rehab Eastern Regional Project by decreasing the amount by $43,386.83 for a revised total of $4,399,049.71. All right. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 OMB. John. Good afternoon. I have five resolutions for your consideration. 1482 to authorize appropriation amendments, 1483 to authorize additional appropriations, 1484 to authorize cash transfers, 1485 to authorize appropriation decreases, and 1486 to establish a special revenue fund, Fund 297, Subfund 161, known as the Board of Elections Private Foundation Funding Grant. I move for approval. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Human services. Tom. Uh, thank you. Under human services planning and development, uh, resolution 20-1487 will submit a proposal to the Urban Institute for Inclusion in the Upward Mobility Cohort. And then we have, we need to amend agreements to support COVID-19 relief activities and expenses. Uh, these are contracts that will be funded by the Human Services Levy. 1488 is with Goodwill Easter Seals of Miami Valley by increasing the amount by $50,000 for a revised total not to exceed $206,385 through June 30th, 30th of 2021. 1489 is with the Joint Office of Citizen Complaints, also known as the Ombudsman, by increasing the amount by $44,453 for revised total not to exceed $135,198 through December 31st of 2020. I also have two late items. Uh, these are, again, more amendments to support COVID-19 relief activities and expenses. These are also funded by the Human Services Levy. 
1495 is with Artemis Center by increasing the amount by $40,000 for a revised total not to exceed $315,134. And 1496 with Big Brothers Big Sisters of the Greater Miami Valley Incorporated by increasing the amount by $64,835.62 for a revised total not to exceed $89,835.62. I move for approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Business Services, Chris. Good afternoon. I have two resolutions, one late agenda item. Resolution 1490, authorizing small business assistant grant agreements, Group A, through Office of CARES Act with various local businesses through December 30th, 2020. 1491, authorizing small business assistance grant agreements, Group B, through the Office of CARES Act with various local businesses through December 30th, 2020. And 1497, authorizing an agreement with Palisade Arcadia Baseball, LLC, owner of the Dayton Dragons baseball team for the purpose of purchasing personal protective equipment related to COVID-19 pandemic and the amount of $95,000 through December 30th, 2020. I move for approval. Uh, Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Under uh, county commissioners? Chris, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I think, I, think Chris, I think Chris may have had a couple of comments about the CARES Act program. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, certainly, certainly, Tom. Uh, I just wanted to point out and at this particular time, we're, we are uh, well on track to spend out our $92 million uh, allocation. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that Money Valley Community Action Partnership in particular uh, spent out their $5 million allocation servicing 1,587 households with uh, rental assistance. I appreciate that, Chris. I know that was Good. that was a question we had out in the community. So, so I'm glad we were able to um, expend the full five million. Absolutely, and I know the uh, rental assistance continues on uh, with Miami Valley uh, Community Action Partnership with a state program and potentially more funding coming in the future from other sources. But as far as the CARES Act goes, they have spent out their total allocation. And quite honestly, it's a credit to them because we, get, we gave them a really heavy lift and uh, to their credit, they were able to get all this money out the door. And I would only add to that, Chris, because I've gotten a lot of questions about this, is that individuals, um, I think it's uh, miamivalleycap.org is their website. Um, I would not try calling them. Um, the traffic is just, the volume is too high. And I've looked at the home screen of Miami Valley CAP and a lot of information's right there. And there's a portal for getting in your application um, started. And, you know, just like our funding, um, it'll be as people get in and it gets allocated, it will go. So no one should hold off uh, trying to talk to somebody, get your applications in and help us spread the word because uh, I know from many sources, there's still a lot of people who need help. So um, there's a short time to get this done, but to get on to miamivalleycap.org. Okay. Thank you. Under County Commissioners 20-1492, appoint Paul Lamberger to the Water Services Appeals Board for a three-year term ending August 31st, 2023. 20-1493, reappoint Elizabeth Sirk to the Monday Facility Governing Board for a three-year term ending December 31st, 2023. So I believe we're having a hearing first before we adjourn. So- I'll move approval for those last items. Oh, that would help, thank you. <laughs> All those in favor, aye. aye. Okay, so let's talk about the hearing. Uh, Judy, would you like Judy, would you like to hold on other comments until after the hearing? Well, let me ask you this. Is everybody staying on here to hear the uh, hearing or because I don't see that we adjourn until after the hearing. Right. Okay. But you know what? L let's go ahead and make our comments now so that um, we can have that. How's that? So I know that, um, as I mentioned, our county administrator, Michael Colbert's father passed away. 
And I know that we're all sending sympathy and condolences to him and his family. I know that Tom, you knew his father very well and you wanted to say a few words. Well, I, I want to mention, I've, I've, known, I've had the pleasure of knowing the Colbert family for a, for a long time. Uh, like Michael, I grew up in Greene County. So I, I did in fact know the Colberts very well and I knew Anison, A.J. Colbert, Michael's dad very well. Um, he was one of our prominent African-American businessmen in the community. Um, he owned the, well, he and the family owned the Colbert Funeral Home in Xenia. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very active in the community for a long time and he'll be, he'll be missed by all of the community in Greene County, in Xenia, and quite frankly, in the entire area. I think it's also worth noting on a day that we provided our update to the community on um, racism as a, as a health crisis. Um, it's worth noting that in 2013, uh, Anison Colbert was inducted into the Civil Rights Hall of Fame for the state of Ohio. So he was a person who was active in his community. He was active in general. Uh, he was actually the first African-American to receive a national funerals director license from Ohio. So he was out there leading the way. He was out there doing things and, and he, he received recognition that he well deserved. And I think it, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree when you think about Michael. And I know Michael's heart is breaking today and Michael was always very proud of his father. He was always... Uh, very gracious in sharing his father with us in stories. And one thing I would add is that when, when Mike, well, I was there when Michael's father was inducted into the Ohio Civil Rights Hall of Fame for that ceremony. And it's worth noting that the motto that Michael's father lived by was good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good becomes better and your better becomes best. And that's the way that Michael's father lived his life. So I, I think it's worth, you know, celebrating and, and remembering Anison Colbert today and the work that he did on behalf of his community and the broader community throughout our entire area and the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share that. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, thank you, Tom, for sharing that. Did you have any other comments that you wanted to make as far as... Um... Um, well, I mean, we've already we've already spoken about the CARES Act. Um, Chris shared things with us there. We also know that additionally, uh, the work with DPNL and Vectoran has been moving forward and wrapping up. We know that we helped about fifteen thousand customers with utility relief uh, through four and a half million dollars through DPNL to about ten thousand customers, and about eight hundred thousand dollars through Vectoran to, to about forty five hundred customers. Uh, so we, we really need to, to thank the CARES Act team and everyone at DPNL and Vectran for making those things happen. Uh, we've already thanked CAP for the work that they've done. So, um, you know, as the CARES Act winds down and our efforts wrap up in the community and all that good work that's still happening, it's really important to thank everyone who's really been involved in the CARES Act. Um, I'd also like to send a shout out to my team in JFS. Um, for the month of October, we were the highest rated county for timeliness in SNAP at 97.54% timeliness in the pandemic. So we're, we're leading the way there. I wanna thank them for all their efforts. Um, so we're, you know, with all the county departments doing everything we can to help everyone out there. And, and you know, it's really rewarding to see the work that everyone in every county department is doing to help everyone that they can. Uh, so with that, Judy, I'll hand back off to you Okay. for Good. any other comments. Okay. Uh, I was just going to mention that um, this uh, yesterday began the Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week. And uh, this week is really about educating our community about how some of our very own county citizens are really struggling to survive and to obtain basic necessities like food and shelter. And I think that uh, Jerry Piggy's talked about some of the concerns that we have in some of our neighborhoods as far as uh, homelessness and food, uh, food insecurity. And uh, in a little bit, Commissioner Rice and I are gonna head over to uh, Sinclair where the Homeful Mobile Grocery Store 
is going to be on display so they can show they're going to show how food is becoming more accessible to our communities that don't have any grocery stores nearby. I didn't know if Commissioner Rice, if you wanted to say something. Sure. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure you've been done. So yeah. uh, yes, this is uh, Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there's a 44 day challenge and I'm taking it. So I'm, I uh, am committed to learning as much as I can. And uh, uh, I invite anyone in the community to take part in it. Um, so yes, we'll be at Sinclair uh, between three and five today. So anyone, if you happen to be uh, close by, stop by and see it for yourself. You're going to be amazed yeah. to see a grocery on wheels. And also tomorrow there's a Zoom meeting. So you don't even have to leave your house. Uh, and it's called a community conversation on homelessness. And um, it'll be at 10 a.m. tomorrow tomorrow. And um, they're going to interview some of our homeless citizens. Um, so to hear from them uh, what they think we could do to help with their situation. So it should be very enlightening, but you, you do have to register for that meeting. Um, so if you're interested, I would suggest you go to um, bit, B-I-T dot L-Y uh, forward slash the social and then H-H-A-W and that's two H's uh, to register for that meeting. And I'll also just add that um, this today is National Entrepreneurs Day. So a lot is going on. Debbie, you're muted. Oh, I was just talking how great you are, Commissioner. Um, no, what I was saying was, Carolyn's right, we have so much going on, and um, it, it seems like every week there's more and more, even through COVID, and, and so I was just kind of monitoring what the governor was, was saying right now, and we know there's going to be some changes, and so, you know, I, I just plead with our community that we can yeah. continue to, you know, wear the mask, I, I know Judy will say that at the end, but we, we, have, <laughs> we have to continue to fight hard because it's it's our families it's our friends um you know early on i remember people would on social media say does anybody know anybody that has it well i can't i've lost track of how many people i know um including a, a friend that passed away and a, a, a friend's father that just passed away so we don't want that to happen to anybody anybody at all and so as we move into a, you know Thanksgiving, we have a lot to be thankful for, but we also need to make sure that we're very, very careful next week. Um, and in some of the things that the governor, I'm sure, has rolled out today, uh, we'll be supportive of, um, and we'll we'll do what we have to do until we can get rid of this horrible plague. So, on a happier note. Um, I guess it's happier for me it's happier. Um, you know, one of my favorite things to talk about is our animal resource center. And um, the numbers, I'm gonna give us the numbers for last month. They adopted out 104 dogs and returned back 78 lost dogs. And, you know, our numbers now are, it's just so great to, to see how, when everybody's working together, we have a great team there. Thank you, Chris um, and Bob. You know, we're, we really are doing good work there even through COVID. And um, the animal care and control officers um, are, are really trying to, when they're out in the field, trying to get the dogs back to their owners so that they don't have to take them into the shelter, the animal resource center. So um, they're, they're also every day, and I share this a lot when I see them, um, they, they take a picture of the dog right away and then they share it on Facebook and mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they're sharing on Instagram or not, but they share that dog and um, the pictures and the location where they found it. And so that way people can uh, call in, they give the number, they give the dog's um, number. And, and again, and, and this is the time of the year that we start to talk about it, you know, make sure your dog is licensed. And if it's licensed or chipped, we can find them 
get them back home immediately. So um, that's really important. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, um, we're not gonna be able to do some of the fun things we do um, to promote the, promote our dogs, but also uh, to adopt out our dogs. So the ARC will not be having our um, single day adoption event that we always do around Thanksgiving, is send them home Saturday. Uh, we're not gonna be doing that. But um, what we're doing now between November 30th is everybody who adopts a dog will be given the option um, to spin a wheel for a chance to save money on their adoption or to get their adoption fee completely waived. And so um, it's a really good, good opportunities. And there's some adorable dogs that we have for adoption right now. So, and, and speaking of one, he decided to join me. I don't know if anybody can see him here. Can you see, oh, there he is. Oh. <laughs> That's Thunder, he came from the ARC and they've been very good today. So I wanna thank my dogs for not being loud today. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think it's time for our hearing. 20-1494, uh, the Mad River, Alex Bell Road Intersection Improvement Project. And yes. let's see um, who's first up to say yeah. something. Well, yeah, commissioners, uh, Okay. Rex Dickey is our project manager on the project and he'll be doing the okay. presentation. Okay, is Ward, are you swearing anybody in? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. And Emily, is everybody in? They're is all it? in, yes. I think a couple of them are waiting to connect to audio, so you might just want to wait just a second to swear them in. Well, yeah, commissioners. Uh, okay. Rex Dickey is our project manager on the project and he'll be doing the okay. presentation. Okay. <laughs> Ward, are you swearing anybody in? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. Emily, is everybody in? They're yeah. all yes. I think a couple of them are waiting to connect to audio, so they might just want to wait just a second to swear them in. So there is. Well, yeah, commissioners. Uh, okay. Rex Dickey is our project manager on the project, and he'll be doing okay. it. If all of the participants and, and, could mute and, them. And anyone not speaking should mute order. themselves to reduce there the echoes. Is. Yes. Okay. You read it? Everybody in, Emily? Yeah, everyone's in. There are still a couple waiting to connect to audio, but. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Mr. Gruner and Mr. Dickey, if you would raise your right hand. Likewise, any member of the public who wishes to address um, the uh, county commission um, when you are called, uh, if you would likewise raise your hand and everyone will take the oath together. You read it? Yep. Do all of you swear or affirm that the testimony you will offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please answer, I do. I do. And gentlemen, um, Mr. Gruner. Okay, Ward, is everybody sworn in? And then is Paul start? Paul Gruner? Or is everybody sworn in, Ward? Yes, Ms. Dodge, yes. Okay, all right. Then you start then, Paul, right? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, Rex Dickey's our project manager. He'll be doing a presentation. He'll be okay. sharing his screen shortly. Okay. Are we ready for that? We're ready. Okay. Yep. Well, I thought we were ready. There we go. All right, well, good afternoon commissioners and good afternoon to everybody who's joining the uh, the hearing. 
today. And this is a hearing for the proposed intersection of the uh, improvement of the intersection of Mad River Road and Alex Bell Road in Washington Township. And just to uh, just to zero in on the location of the project, it's uh, Alex Bell Road is classified as a uh, minor arterial east-west. Mad River Road is a major collector, kind of a north-south, even though they don't run true north-south and east-west. Uh, but they do, uh, they do connect, uh, both of them actually collect, connect uh, some pretty good sized uh, population centers. And you can see very close to the intersection is uh, <clears throat> Yankee Street and, and Munger Road both come in to Mad River, very close to the intersection. Uh, McEwen Road is to the east, um, uh, Whip Road to the north. So when we look at the intersection itself and the, the project itself is, is very compact and localized uh, just to the intersection. Um, you see the, the addresses here, 1421, 1424, uh, 6434 Mad River, Creekview Estates is, uh, I think there are five condominiums there. And the proper, what you're looking at here, 1440 Haven Hill, there's a pond at the intersection. And uh, the, this property in general happens to be the property that uh, Dr. John Hole moved to when he first came to this area. And uh, so maybe if we get a chance, we can talk a little more about that later. But this is, this is the area. Holes Creek uh, crosses Alex Bell right here. And that bridge is currently uh, under construction uh, rehabilitation, actually. And uh, then Holes Creek, it's a little bit off the picture, but it crosses Mad River Road uh, about 500 feet south of the intersection. And that bridge was rehabilitated last year. So why, why do we even look at this intersection? Well, currently it's a four-way stop, but there are two major reasons why. Uh, crashes and congestion. When we look at crashes, and uh, I should say, I should probably add at this point that in, in 2017, we, um, we commissioned a traffic study, traffic analysis, and a safety study. Uh, we did that jointly with the Washington Township trustees, hired an engineering firm, American Structure Point. And uh, so when, when we look at the crashes over a, uh, at that point, we had three years of data, 2014 to 2016. This intersection consistently, year in, year out, ranks near, right at the top or very near the top of our high crash rate locations on the county road system. Over 40, uh, at, over those three years, there were 40 intersection related crashes. 60% uh, of those were rear end crashes, 30% were angle crashes. Uh, but even more significant here is the fact that 45% of those crashes resulted in injuries. And the, other, uh, the other problem at this intersection is congestion. Um, both uh, Alex Bell and Mad River each carry uh, approximately 9,000 vehicles a day. Um, but in the morning peak hour in the evening peak uh, peak time, this, this four-way stop uh, creates backups on each leg of the intersection that can range from anywhere from uh, 800 feet to 1,000 feet. Uh, on south of the intersection, the backup can, uh, can extend past Munger Road, uh, which tees into Mad River and even past Yankee Street. So uh, in, the, uh, in the grading system for operation of an intersection uh, or well, just the ability for traffic to move without delay, uh, the grading system is like just in school, it's from A to F, A being the best, F being the worst. And this one uh, grades out at a level service F as a four-way stop. So with the, 
with the results of the traffic analysis, Stacy study, and some preliminary engineering, um, we went to the public to get the, the public's perception and comments and present the findings of the study. Uh, that was done in June of 2018. And I think we had, uh, I think we had about 40, 40 to 45 uh, citizens attend that meeting. Uh, and then we even opened it up to a 30-day uh, comment period after that. And after considering all the comments made both at the public meeting and uh, those that came in by mail or over the phone, uh, a one-lane roundabout was selected as the best alternative for this intersection. And here's a view of, of, what, uh, of what the one lane roundabout will look like. And uh, it's, it's uh, actually, the, as I said uh, before, it's kind of a compact uh, project. That is, there's really not too much roadway work along Alex Bell or along Mad River. And the, the one lane roundabout, just single lane, um, is, is situated such that um, it, does, uh, it does encroach onto the property at, the, uh, at 1424 Alex Bell, uh, but there's no, no uh, right of way needed from the uh, Haven Hill property, from the condominiums, uh, uh, and just a very small temporary easement from 1634, just to trans, just to tie in the driveway. Uh, and there will be some impact here to 1421. I'll talk about that a little more as well. But you can see that that uh, the, the intersection has shifted just just a, a little bit to the to the south and to the uh, east. Uh, but this is, uh, you see the red X is where the house that's currently there will be demolished as part of the project. So what is a roundabout? Well, roundabouts are, are circular intersections and it just requires uh, that uh, the driver uh, yield to traffic, yielded entry to traffic that's already within the circle. And it's designed to operate at about 20 miles an hour and, and that's, that's, again, that's by design, that's uh, in, intended to reduce speeds and reduce speeds means uh, fewer crashes and no traffic signals are required with a roundabout. And one of the things I did wanna show is a, is a simulation that's created by traffic engineering software. And you see side by side uh, the operation of the four-way stop, and this is with current traffic. And you can see the long backups on each leg of the intersection. On the right is the operation of a roundabout. Now the, the traffic volumes here are even a little bit greater than current day because it's based on projected volume. So it's a greater volume. And you can see that even with a greater volume, there are, there are no backups. And, and traffic moves freely and smoothly through the intersection. And just to give a kind of an example of what some roundabouts look like um, in various locations. I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit because I just wanna show that because uh, questions about school buses, yeah. School buses can certainly uh, navigate through a roundabout. Uh, emergency vehicles, fire trucks can. And I just wanna maybe pause at this point and point out because we've had questions about, uh, well, can large trucks uh, handle a roundabout? The answer is yes, they can. And, and roundabouts are designed, uh, in fact, to handle large trucks, semis. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you can see, there's a, a red brick or uh, what appears to be brick. It's actually stamped concrete. 
uh, ring around the inner circle. And that's called the truck apron. What that allows the truck to do in order to make the turning movements is uh, it actually allows for the rear wheels of, of a semi to, uh, to get up onto the apron uh, to be able to, to navigate their way around. So it's, uh, it's not purely decorative, it's there by design, it's functional, and, and it's what allows trucks to, uh, large trucks, to, to use the, uh, the roundabout. And here's one just, here's one that's uh, close to us. It's in Butler County. And uh, there on the left, you can see the truck apron. And we're just following our way around. Uh, the Butler County engineer has at least 20 roundabouts on the, on the county road system there. So the advantage of the roundabout, well, for safety. Uh, studies, the data taken from, from roundabouts that are in operation, not just in Ohio, but nationwide, have shown that for, uh, for similar, uh, similar situations, that they result in a 35% reduction in all types of crashes, that they can reduce injuries resulting from crashes by up to 76% and even 90% reduction in fatalities. So these are really significant differences. Uh, in addition, um, of course they are definitely more efficient during peak times of traffic. This, uh, in this situation, the level of service uh, improves from an F to an A. And they are, and equally, they're even, well, even better, even more efficient in off-peak hours. Uh, so there's less delay, which saves gas, reduces pollution, fewer stops and starts, you're not uh, sitting in traffic, there's less idling, and, and uh, for those reasons also, it's more quiet. So we have already uh, committed to, uh, to put on an information campaign uh, as we approach the time when the, the roundabout would be open to traffic through press releases, news media on our website uh, to help explain and educate the drivers how to, how to operate through a roundabout. Now this will be the first one in Montgomery County on the county road system, but certainly not the first one in Ohio. Uh, there are currently more than 200 roundabouts throughout the state and, of course, thousands more nationwide. Uh, our neighbors uh, to the south, neighboring counties, uh, have actually had much more experience already. Uh, as I said earlier, the Butler County engineer has over 20 on the county road system there, and the, the Warren County engineer has eight roundabouts already in operation. So to talk specifically about the uh, effects to the, to the properties at the intersection, uh, at, 1420, at 1421, uh, which is, it's a residence. Uh, it's a house that sets somewhat below road level. Um, the, and you can see the area shaded in green is the area that would be needed uh, for additional uh, permanent highway easement uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, is, is to, uh, why, there'll be a little bit of widening of the pavement around the intersection. And by widening pavement, that means that the, the slope, the embankment that holds up the roadway would have to be also widened and, and expanded somewhat. So that's the reason, one reason for this uh, need for additional easement. But the second reason uh, is uh, the uh, Dayton Power and Light uh, electric lines will need to be relocated. The, the pole will, needs to be ro relocated about 20 feet to the east uh, so that it would be out of the new, uh, new pavement area and well behind the curb. And the, the, so therefore the uh, electric lines will 
run from that new pole back to the existing pole and within the easement area. Um, so in order to reconstruct this part of the embankment, uh, the brush trees would need to be cleared. There are, uh, I think, three evergreens that are X'd out that would have to be removed. And, uh, the, and in addition, there would be a, a, a temporary easement as well to allow contractor access and, and moving equipment. Just to point those out in, uh, in, in uh, aerial view, picture view, those, those are the trees we talked about. This electric pole would have to move somewhere over in here and connect to that pole at that location along Mad River. Driveway would have to be uh, rebuilt, but no real change in, in, in grade or elevation. The other property uh, at, at 1634, uh, is a, uh, which is on Mad River, on the, uh, I guess on the east side, uh, just a, a small temporary easement just to adjust the driveway to the new, to the, uh, to the roadway. And the property at 1424 uh, is, is owned by the county commissioners. Uh, and it's a, it's a property that became av available for purchase shortly after the, uh, the public meeting was held and, and decision was made on the uh, on the preferred alternative of a roundabout, and even at that point, it was obvious that uh, construction of a roundabout uh, would would be so close to the house that that uh, really uh, it would be necessary to go ahead and acquire the whole property. So Montgomery County already owns the property. The area in green would need to be. Uh, dedicated for uh, as a permanent highway easement in order to maintain the roadway and the uh, and the swale behind it and the the residents then would be demolished most likely towards the end of the uh, construction uh, contract itself and this is a 6434 just showing the short section of driveway which would be rebuilt The project cost uh, is uh, the construction cost is estimated at just under one million dollars. The uh, the engineering cost uh, two hundred fifty six thousand dollars. Of course, right of way costs uh, for easements that uh, we really can't can't say yet until uh, those become those are appraised by independent real estate appraisals. But after the uh, after the public meeting. Um, the county engineer applied for federal safety funds mm -hmm. and, and, was, uh, and, and uh, our, our application was accepted. So uh, the federal safety funds will cover 90% of uh, construction and design costs and 70% of right-of-way costs. Uh, in, in addition to that, we've applied for an Ohio Public Works Commission grant of $200,000. And, and if approved, that would be used, uh, applied to the local matching to match the federal funds. So uh, you know, those are, that, that's 90% uh, uh, coverage of uh, construction and design is, uh, it is, is pretty unusual and, and, uh, and a very good, uh, very good grant. Project schedule, uh, right of way acquis acquisition would start, uh, well, the uh, appraisals would start. Uh, appraisals title work starts uh, December and uh, could run the whole acquisition process with, you know, making offers and then negotiations. Uh, uh, finally, the closing could run through October of of next year. With that, uh, the uh, utility relocation, uh, the DPNL pole electric lines, 
and the, uh, the clearing of trees to make that um, possible could start then no, um, in the uh, early winter of 2021, perhaps run through March. Uh, and the construction contract itself would uh, tentatively would, would begin May of 2022. Uh, last, uh, probably, I'm showing August here, uh, I would say a three to four month construction period. Uh, it will be necessary to close uh, the intersection itself to traffic during construction. There's really no way to uh, build temporary pavement to maintain traffic through the intersection. So each leg will be detoured. Oh, um, we have, of course, detour uh, route of Munger Road, um, Whip Road, Whip to 48, back to Alex Bell. Here's McEwen to 725. These are, uh, essentially, these are detour routes that, that that the public has used before uh, when we've had to uh, uh, detour traffic for bridge construction, the bridge on Mad River and now the, uh, currently the bridge on Alex Bell. And just, uh, just a little bit about uh, the legacy of Dr. John Holt, uh, who was the, um, the first uh, physician in the Miami Valley, came to this area, settled here in uh, 1796. Um, he fought in the Revolutionary War and was the personal surgeon and physician to General Richard Montgomery. He came here, he and two others uh, surveyed and established uh, Mad River Road. And at that time, it was, it was uh, about a 38 mile roadway from the Cincinnati area all the way up to uh, the center of Dayton, what is now the center of Dayton at the mouth of the Mad River. Um, only five miles of Mad River Road really are left today uh, that, that are in, that's in use and it runs from, uh, from David Road in Kettering to State Route 725. Um, on, on the, uh, these two spring houses are still standing and actually they're still operating um, at the, uh, at close to the northwest corner of the intersection. And in fact, uh, water from the spring houses is, is pumped to, uh, to feed the pond there. So, uh, so there, there, there is quite a legacy, quite a history here. Uh, with that, uh, commissioners, uh, do you have any questions at this point? No, I know that area well, so. Um, okay. Yep, yep. Okay, well, I will turn the screen back then to Emily. We do have a few um, citizens that wish to speak. So when I call your name, if you would just unmute yourself and then you can you can um, uh, say your comments. We'll start with um, Jesse Lytle. Good afternoon. My name is Jesse Lytle. I'm the Washington Township Administrator, 8200 McEwen Road, Washington Township, Ohio. Thank you all. It's nice to see everyone. I miss seeing everyone in person, but Hollywood Squares will have to do for today. I, I just wanted to take a, a brief opportunity to um, talk about our support for the project. Um, as uh, Rex mentioned in his presentation, the Washington Township trustees did partner with the County Engineer's Office um, very early on and, and studied this intersection and also um, the Yankee um, uh, intersection, uh, really, I guess, to the south as well. We looked at both. Um, we've participated with the county throughout the project. We've been involved in the public meetings. 
Um, in the public meeting that was held at Watts Middle School, the residents, um, for the most part, were, were supportive of the improvements. Certainly, we have concerns, uh, safety concerns for our residents that are using this intersection. Um, and then also congestion concerns. We, we hear about congestion quite a bit um, relative to this uh, four-way stop. So we look forward to the continued partnership with the engineer's office as this project uh, moves forward. The Alex Bell Bridge project looks like it's wrapping up. Looks like there's some guardrail going in and it might be completed just a tad um, ahead of schedule, which would be nice because that's what happened on Mad River as well. Um, so uh, we just wanted to go on the record today officially um, and cast our support. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Next, John Morris. Good evening, commissioners. I uh, wish uh, my name is John Morris. I am uh, president of the Montgomery County Township Association and also president of the Board of Trustees in Miami Township. I am here speaking as neither of those organizations, rather as a citizen who lives very close to this intersection at 2203 Sycamore Hills Drive, Miami Township, 45459. And I just wanted to uh, voice my support of the project. Uh, thank the commissioners for taking this project on. This has been a, a long time uh, coming in finding a solution to this four-way stop. Uh, I think you'll find a, a large number of residents uh, are uncomfortable with roundabouts and they'll express their concerns uh, that they're difficult to navigate. Uh, I would share that many of those same residents are ones who have difficulty figuring out a four-way stop. So uh, I don't want that to be uh, any hesitation in moving forward to this project. I'd also like to uh, uh, commend the county engineer for finding the use of these federal safety funds and reducing the burden on the county. Uh, I think it's a great design and uh, I would very much as a resident love to see this project move forward. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, next, James Gallagher. Good afternoon, um, Jim Gallagher and I live at uh, 294 Cherry Drive in Centerville. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanna send my kudos to uh, Rex Dickey, the project manager uh, in the military vernacular, he did a bravo Zulu job. If you don't know what that means, look it up. Uh, and I'm a project manager by profession, now retired. I spent six years on the uh, Project Man Management Institute International Board of Directors, and I'm proud to be uh, a fellow of the Project Management Institute. So I know a little bit about project management. So, um, I want to comment in support of the uh, of the roundabout. Uh, I have been navigating that intersection for decades, and probably looking at all my colleagues aboard, probably um, more so than anyone else in this uh, in this audience today. And uh, it's I've complained over the decades, as Paul can uh, attest. We're both uh, Rotarians, along with Carolyn and the other county commissioners, and. He usually, uh, when we were having face-to-face -face meetings, uh, go, heads the other direction. So <laughs> it's been a hazarded, hazard over the, the, the years. And uh, so um, I'm coming out in support. A couple of observations. First of all, I've traveled extensively in Europe and domestically and uh, enjoyed uh, getting used to roundabouts. And I think that the the concern by citizens is is well well made, but it's uh, fairly easy to uh, navigate, uh, and, and especially in Ireland. I'm uh, I'm Irish and have been in Ireland uh, eight times, and uh, even though they drive on the wrong side of the road, and uh, after having a couple of pints of Guinness, I've never had a problem with uh, navigating the uh, the roundabouts in Ireland. And most recently, I. Uh, experienced the one of the new ones in uh, I guess it's uh, Warren County the one at uh, State Route maybe 122 and the extension of Clio whatever that is and that's great I mean that was another uh, uh, hazard I thought so uh, my point on roundabouts from personal experience is that they're safe they're environmentally fr friendly they're efficient they're cost effective and they're quiet. 
And uh, so for, for full disclosure, I'm gonna show you my sweatshirt today. Uh, uh, Paul is a, Paul Gruner is a, a UC grad and I have a, my youngest grandson is, a, is a UC right now. And Paul has not tried to bribe me. In fact, I've tried to bribe him to make this go quicker, even to the point of naming this the, the Jim Gallagher roundabout, but he, uh, he doesn't go along with that. So uh, when, when we approve this, uh, I'll settle for a, a shamrock plant there, uh, maybe with a little grass plaque. <laughs> and so, you know, my bottom line is it's about time it, and uh, I totally support uh, the, the, this wonderful project. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that is on the call right now that wishes to speak? Uh, I would like to. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Bromlin. Oh, hi. Uh, hey, everyone. I want to show you uh, exactly how close I am to said roundabout area. This is my front door. You're now looking at the intersection of Mad River Road and Alex Bell. Uh, I'm in total support of a roundabout. The reason I say that, I have lived here for 20 years. In that time, I have seen some very horrible crashes. Uh, most people are oblivious that there's a, even an intersection here. And I've seen them slam into cars just 60 miles an hour. It's crazy. So I, I totally support it. I really do. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the call that would like to speak? If not, commissioners, I do have, there were two citizens that provided comments that they would like, they weren't able to come to the hearing, but they would like their uh, their statement read. And, Emily, I think um, there was one citizen who was oh, waiting. Oh, oh. Yeah, um, this is Diane Weirauk. Um, our family has a very long association with that intersection in that area. Having grown up just up the hill from there, my dad passed away four and a half years ago at almost 92, and he grew up in what's now a farm that was at, that's now become Vienna Parkway. So we really know that intersection, having known how to, learned how to drive there and everything. And it's like, this seems like it's probably something that's going to preserve the integrity of the neighborhoods and keep the pollution and the sound and move traffic through. But what I'm concerned about is some of the unintended consequences, because as people are accelerating out of a roundabout, back up to speed, a lot of the areas there, you may find the traffic is going to be going a little faster than you would anticipate when you have a four-way stop, you at least have a gap where traffic is stopping and starting and stopping and starting, and you have a gap to get out of side streets around that area. But when they start accelerating coming out of a roundabout, I'm afraid you're gonna end up having to put in traffic signals like at Munger, maybe, maybe um, Imperial Woods, a couple of, of the streets in that area, Yankee because traffic is going to be going so fast and there's not going to be a gap if there's a continuous flow, especially during peak times. It is, it is going to move things through the intersection faster, but I'm concerned about the neighborhoods around there, people being able to get in and out of their plats easily without a lot of backup. And that's, that's just one comment. Other than that, I think they've done a fantastic job with the planning, the acquiring funds and everything else. And something does need to be done with that intersection, but granted you've got hills, you've got snow and ice, you've got all different types of weather conditions. You're still gonna have accidents, but I think this might relieve some of the problems, but it's like anything. I mean, this road was never intended to hold this kind of traffic flow that it has now so something does have to be done with it we'll see what happens I'm, I'm just looking down the road to some unintended consequences afterwards because i think the idea and the the execution on it is very good okay thank you is there anyone else on the call that would like to speak Okay, so I am going to read the two citizens' comments that they would like um, into the record that they weren't able to attend today. So 
The first one is from Mr. John Risco. He's, with my, he's a resident of Miami Township. He states, I am a 40 year resident of Miami Township and live one mile from the intersection. I travel through the intersection frequently and acknowledge that it can back up during AM, PM rush hour and from Thanksgiving to New Year's Day. Accidents appear to occur when drivers don't signal, fail to give right of way, or are distracted as they inch up to the mm -hmm. stop. Mm -hmm. My overall concern of this roundabout focuses on the fact that many drivers don't understand how a four-way stop operates, of which I guess we have hundreds of in Montgomery County. Given that, how can we expect drivers to understand how a roundabout operates, of which we have zero in Montgomery County? Where there is confusion, there will be accidents. A few years ago in the city of Dayton, many one-way streets were converted to two-way. The reason given was one-way streets are too confusing. A recent report performed by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety suggests that confusion on when, where, and how to enter the circle accounts for more than half of all roundabout collisions, while unsafe speeds account for the majority of the rest. 75% of them merely result in property damage. However, the remaining 25% have the potential to result in serious injuries due to, due, to a various, due to various collision types. Central island collision, rear end collisions, side swipe collisions, entering collisions, and exiting collisions. If this intersection is turned into a roundabout, we will just be trading accident types. It also has the potential to increase the accident rate current average is 13 per year due to confusion. I oppose the construction of a roundabout at this intersection. So that's the first one. The second one and the last comment is from uh, Mr. Dan Keene and his comments are as follows. I was reviewing the presentation on the county website for the Mad River Alex Bell intersection improvement and I noted that the design does not improve pedestrian or bicycle traffic access. This section of Washington Township is very old and is dangerous, but Mad River represents the safest route from Kettering to the Dayton Mall and Austin Landing for both bicyclists and pedestrians. If the graphic in your presentation is accurate, the county has made no allowance for crosswalks or bike lanes in the design. This is unacceptable because it discourages alternative transportation and perpetuates the bias towards automobiles that has led to unnecessary congestion on our roads. Regardless of whether or not you are receiving funds from the MVRPC, it is in the best interest of our community that this project complies with their complete streets vision. Quote, all current and projected users of the public right of way should be able to safely and conveniently reach their destinations along and across a street or road, regardless of their cho chosen mode of transportation, end quote. I expect the county to do its best to improve conditions for pedestrians and bicyclists so that we can use our public streets without unnecessary fear or risk. The area in the graphic appears to have sufficient room for crosswalks and dedicated bike lanes in all directions. If there is some requirement that prevents this, I expect that the project will include quote, bicycles may use full lane signs at the start of each entrance to the roundabout and that the pavement include, quote, shared lane marking. I have ridden through roundabouts without these markings and a few but too many drivers seem indignant that I am there or worse, ignore my right of, my right of way and cut me off. These markings are required to enable me and other bicy bicyclists to safely use the roads. Addition